All right, we are rolling now. Counting us down. Three, two. You're listening to Missing Out with Lex Michael and Tari J. Let's start the show. Hey guys, welcome back to Missing Out. I'm Tari J. I'm Lex Michael. And if this is your first time listening, what we do here is we introduce each other to different media, whether it be movies, music, television, spoken word, books, experiences, things that have built us up as people. We hope that in sharing it, it builds you up. We are the retrospective that's introspective. See, that's expert introing. That's why you're the very best podcast host. When you absolutely positively got to let every motherfucker in the room know what your show is about, except no substitutes. Hell yeah. Yeah, baby. Uh, we're talking about Jackie Brown, the 1997 black exploitation film or black exploitation inspired film by Quentin Tarantino starring Robert De Niro, Samuel Jackson, Pam Greer. What? I like that you lead with Robert De Niro. <laughs> it was the first name that came to my brain. Um, yeah. Where, where did I leave off? Um, uh, Robert Forrester, uh, if that's how you pronounce his that last is, name. That is how you pronounce it. Great. Name. Uh, with appearances by Chris Tucker. What? This is great. This is great. No, no, no. Don't let me stop you. <laughs> um, the lady who plays the girlfriend, Melanie, uh, <laughs> who is famous, whose name I can't remember. Also, the lady from couple episodes but a really interesting arc in uh svu in which she plays Ludacris's mother uh but he also happens to be the spoiler alert child of incest oh uh i forget her full name her last name is hamilton she plays um the the crack girlfriend oh okay Yes, uh, Cheryl, I think her name might be. Doesn't matter. Um, but that is all the information about Jackie Brown that you need to know going in. I don't know if that's true. It's just all the information. Um, <laughs> also, uh, I, yes, he's uh, Quentin Tarantino, writer director of Jackie Brown, was pulling inspiration from a number of black exploitation movies. But I wouldn't consider this movie, nor do I believe he considers this movie to be a black exploitation. Spike movie. Lee does, though. We could talk about that if you want to, because that's it's worth it's worth talking about. So I mean, Spike Lee doesn't like this movie. Spike Lee doesn't like this movie. Um, I mean, he's a his big criticism is the use of the N word, which is very present. And we know that it is a very big thing that Quentin Tarantino Quentin Tarantino really likes he uh, his his claim is that he grew up watching black exploitation film which is true and so he uh, feels uh, uh, I guess a fondness of the n-word and so he likes to include it in his works he views himself as an artist and one of the colors that he uses in his on his canvas is the n-word <laughs> I mean okay that's one way to put it um yeah, it's like one of his big signatures. It's like some, you know how um, uh, you know, uh, golf would use his cubism uh, or like Picasso. Uh, he had Starry Night, which has like very heavy brush strokes. And so you get the, the, the full image, but most of it is comprised of smaller brush strokes. So Quentin Tarantino's small brush strokes are the, the N word. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, uh, there is not a single instance of the N word in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Coincidentally, there aren't any black people <laughs> <laughs> that I that I saw. Um, yeah. And anyway, uh, uh, yes, I guess it's worth getting this out of the way because Quentin Tarantino, obviously, uh, uh, fairly, even though he's one of our more, uh, uh, I guess, popular working American filmmakers, also a very divisive figure. Uh, certainly not a PC filmmaker, and it, it tracks given his influences. He is a guy who is essentially making, he's getting these big budgets and A-list talent to more or less make the kind of schlocky exploitation stuff that he grew up watching, whether it's black exploitation, whether it's spaghetti westerns, whether it's old like Shaw Brothers kung fu stuff. Uh, he's essentially making those. If you know the types the types of movies those are and you know the content that you're going to find 
none of what you see in a Quentin Tarantino movie is all that surprising. Right. But if you don't, then I totally get, I, uh, I understand, I hear and I understand all of the arguments that are, are leveled against his work, right? For example, the, the argument about uh, how he treats his women characters and the way he uh, will have violence inflicted on his women characters. Right. And how uh, it's posited that, that his treatment of women is more egregious than his treatment of men. I disagree with that on its face, but then you also have to consider, especially when it is a white man telling the story, certain types of violence on screen carry more baggage than other types of violence on screen. Right. I do think these are all things, these are very important discussions to have. Uh, I certainly think maybe this is the last guy who should be allowed to make some of the types of movies that he makes until a lot of other folks who aren't white men get a shot at material like this. Right. Uh, I also very much see the argument that he, uh, in the, the homages in the pastiche, uh, that he is, uh, pretty renowned for, you could make the case that there's also a great deal of cultural appropriation going on, which I, I also see those arguments as well. So he's probably the last white dude that should get to do some of the stuff that he does for quite some time. I don't think it's worth getting too heated about because it sounds like the dude's actively planning on canceling himself after his next movie anyway. <laughs> um, I still think he's one of the best American filmmakers, certainly in modern history. I think you can have all of those discussions, and I think they're very important discussions to have as we uh, all try and grapple with uh, the, what the culture has been feeding back to us for years and how we can make progress as far as what we see on screen and who gets to tell what stories. Uh, these are all very important conversations, but for me, they don't detract from the quality of the films themselves. Gotcha. Uh, so that's, you know, like, and, and yeah, like, w what am I going to say? No, Spike, you're, you're getting too worked up about this white filmmaker using the N-word. Uh, no, like, that's... I mean, that's what the internet would say. If you're on Twitter, they'd be like, how dare you, freedom speech, cuck, blood, libtard, etc." Right. Um, I mean, I think that, like, yes, I think that in his, from his point of view, I think that he is, and, and he falls under the category of what people would define as, like, an artur. He has a specific style, and he's making art or whatever. And so, like, he's made, or his intention was to make, 10 films. Um, and I think that like from his perspective, he's just creating what he thinks is cool. And I totally get that. Essentially. Yes. He's, he's going back to all of those, all of the stuff that he ingested when he was younger and, right. and essentially throwing it all in a blender uh, and, and kind of giving it back to everybody is like, yes, this is what, this is what cinema is to me. This is cinematic. Cool. Right. And I don't, I don't think that he necessarily feels the like, burden of the idea of like white privilege like i don't think he feels the burden of like oh like maybe um this representation of this character or how i display these things isn't necessarily either my place or like it isn't necessarily the best representation of these things he is just a dude who's just all in on the creation of art right. and the people's interpretation of that and people's uh i guess how people feel about it isn't necessarily a high priority on the Quentin Tarantino Maslow hierarchy of needs. Right. It's mostly just the creation of the things. And he lives in a society that like also doesn't necessarily put a big priority on those things or haven't in the two decades that he's been working. And so like, oh, man, I know it's almost 30 years now. Yeah. This reservoir dogs was 92. Oh, cool. So in the almost three decades that he's been working. And so like, yes, he has kind of just been able to make whatever he wants and it all makes money because his name sells tickets. Right. And like he doesn't have to think too much about what people are going to think because his movies are, are universally critically well received with the exception of, uh, of, of Grindhouse. But you know what? I'm kind of a death proof apologist. Uh, but critically very well received. They 
they make plenty of money. I mean, cl- clearly any controversy around Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is not hurting it at the box office. It's like a career best opening weekend for him. So he doesn't really have to think too hard about what do people think of my movies because for the most part, he's lauded for all of it. Like the the majority of filmgoers eat this stuff up. Right. So I would imagine what he's getting back, like he knows that people have certain opinions of his work by now, certainly. Yeah. But by and large, he's getting he's he's consistently lauded for all of it. Um, I genuinely think the praise is deserved, but I do think that these are very very important conversations to have. I try to be a little bit careful when talking about Quentin Tarantino's work with other people because it's not for me as a white dude to really have opinions about what is or isn't racist or what is or isn't sexist. Um, I try. And not just with with Tarantino, I try be, and and again, as a white dude, I'll, I'll totally cop to this is a position of privilege that I do my best to separate one from the other while I'm watching something right uh, with with anything. And then later i'll I'll go back and and try and parse through it and and see kind of like what can I learn from it in that regard. Um, but that's a privilege thing, right? Like I get to do that. You know, I've never had uh, uh, I've never not been a white guy. So I've never been in a position of being something other than that and having a white guy tell stories in which somebody that looks like me uh, is treated X or Y way, right. regardless of how the people who look like him are being treated in the movie. Right. So uh, all of this to say, like, this is a long, long, long preamble, uh, I guess, just to get it. Yes. Like, uh, we're very aware that Quentin Tarantino uh, is a, let's call him a problematic filmmaker, maybe. Right. But I I don't I genuinely believe and you know your mileage may vary I believe that Quentin Tarantino has yet to make a movie that isn't great great to excellent and yes I'm including Death Proof I can <laughs> I can no I can I can go to bat for Death Proof I have no opinion because I've never seen it yeah that's it's a conversation for another day but I can genuinely go to bat for Death Proof but Death Proof another example of like a lot of a lot of violence uh, towards towards women in the first half of that movie Right. But, you know, if you know all of the the stuff that he's pulling from, at the very least, uh, whether or not it makes it more palatable for you as an audience member, you're not surprised by any of it. Right. So all of this preamble, why did you bring this in today? Okay, so why did I want to talk about Jackie Brown? So uh, obviously, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, now in theaters, a lot of a lot of people with a lot of takes uh and and as we've been talking about i think these are important conversations to be having i love that movie quite a bit uh and i i figured it was as good a time as any to go back and check out some of his other movies that i haven't seen in a in a handful of years and we talk about yes he's he's an auteur and he has what you call him brush strokes one of which i yes is is the n-word sometimes uh jackie brown is the movie that to me feels the least loaded up with Tarantinoisms. I think part of that is that he's lifting, uh, and this is the only the only example of this in the films he's written and directed, he's lifting from source material. Uh, the movie Jackie Brown is based on the novel Rum Punch mm-hmm. uh, by Elmore Leonard, which is a really fun book. Elmore Leonard, a tremendous author, wrote a ton of uh, mystery stories and Western stories, and you've certainly seen or heard of things that are adapted from his work. The movie Be Cool with John Travolta, uh, the show Justified, was based on a short story of his. Um, And Quentin Tarantino is a massive, massive fan of Elmore Leonard, and he was planning on adapting something by Leonard and fell in love with, with Rum Punch when he read it again for the first time in a few years. And he said, okay, I'm gonna adapt this story, but I'm gonna tweak it a little bit. The novel's set in Florida, so I'm going to take it and move it over to Los Angeles, and I'm going to change this uh, flight attendant character, who in the novel is a blonde named Jackie Burke. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make her Pam Greer, so that I can cast Pam Greer in this this lead. And Pam Greer, of course, super well-known as the lead in a number of black exploitation movies from the early 70s. Uh, She's Coffee, you know, she's in Foxy Brown, Sheba Baby, Black Mama, White Mama, Big Dollhouse. Um, And he's a massive fan of all of those movies. And Pam Greer, super, like, (sighs) Pam Pam Greer is like the epitome of uh, cinematic badass. Like, Coffee, by the way, um, a 
perfect uh, example of a black exploitation movie that I would argue is a pretty great movie. But just so you get an idea, right? Like these movies, whether it's black exploitation or the the kind of grindhouse kung fu stuff, a uh, lot of older westerns, biker movies, a lot of it heavily exploitation based. Surprise! Uh, it's the kind of movie where you know how uh, people will joke sometimes in like a film or television when two women get in a fight, they joke about how like they hope one of them rips off the other shirt and like so their breasts are all out and shit like that. Uh huh. It's the kind of movie where that shit actually happens. Right. Uh. So. Uh, Pam Greer rose rose to some prominence in those films that he's a big fan of. He brought her in for the part, and there's a, a kind of a cute story that she tells about meeting him for the first time when she came in to talk about the movie, where she comes into his office, and he's got all of the posters from her movies all over the walls. And she asks him, like, did you, did you put these up because you knew I was coming? And he said, no, honestly, I, I'm a little embarrassed. I was going to take them down because you were coming over. Uh, and so he was able to bond with her over his affection for those movies. And she says, you know, I didn't even know I was a cult figure. Uh, he told me, mm -hmm. which I think is cute. Yeah. Um, Pam Greer uh, gives this, this wonderful performance. And I think um, Jackie Brown is an incredibly written character, but she is not the only one in the movie. So this was not only the movie that introduced Jackie, Jackie Brown, uh, Pam Greer to a whole new generation of moviegoers. It's also the movie that did the same for the great, Robert Forster, who plays bail bondsman Max Cherry, mm -hmm. uh, who, big career. He had never stopped working, but he he wasn't in a ton that you, you'd know. But he was in, you know, back in the 60s, he was in Medium Cool, uh, the movie that Haskell Wexler made, um, which, which Tarantino's a fan of. So he puts Robert Forster in this movie, and suddenly his career gets a big boost, and now Robert Forster's in a ton of shit. Robert Forster is the guy who now when they're looking for a Robert Forster type, it's like, you know what? Like Robert Forster is, is great and he's in shit again. So let's bring Robert Forster in. And the two of them, in my opinion, are absolutely wonderful together. Um, they're both playing characters that are a little bit older that are, uh, you know, they're, they've reached a point in their lives where it seems like maybe a lot of the options that they once felt they had are no longer available to them, that they, they are looking back maybe with a little bit more regret than they would have hoped to be carrying around at this point in their lives. And they find very unexpectedly uh, this connection with each other. And it allows the movie to occasionally pause and explore, you know, aging, for example, you know, and how the two of them are, are sort of adjusting to being in that place in their lives. It's a movie and it's a relationship within the movie that especially for Tarantino is surprisingly tender and surprisingly mm -hmm. touching. And I do, I, as I said before, we were talking about, I feel like this is the movie of all of his works until maybe Once Upon a Time in Hollywood that feels the least, the least filled with uh, Tarantinoisms. It feels, you know, it's frequently called his most mature work because it feels, and maybe this is a result of, of basing it on source material. Yeah. It all feels a great deal more grounded than many of his other movies, which... Are, for all intents and purposes, they're all live action cartoons. These people all feel like real living, breathing people with yeah. with histories and with fears and with regrets and with doubt. Uh, Sam Jackson in this movie giving one of my favorite performances he's ever given as Ordell Roby, who's the, the gun runner and the ostensible villain of the piece. Yeah. Even he gets genuine moments. He's he's so menacing for so much of this movie, but even he gets moments of genuine doubt and genuine fear. Uh, well, before we get into all these characters and stuff like that, like I feel like we should drop down the spoiler wall because there's a lot that I think that we're going to need to explore, especially like with the themes and uh, and all the character interactions. And I don't know if we can necessarily do that with, um, you know, without spoiling a lot of the very specific things that happen. So I'm giving you guys a good chance to jump out if you'd like to and go check out Jackie Brown. It's on Netflix if you want to check it out. I mean, if you wanted to rent it, like you don't have Netflix, uh, then it's also on Amazon Prime. Um, it's on the iTunes store. It's on Google Play Store. You can get it all the places. Um, so check it out. Yes. Uh, and I would say uh, if you're, if you're going to depart at this point in the conversation, uh, you're curious about checking it out. Maybe you're not a Tarantino fan at all, but if you haven't checked this movie out, I don't think it's going to change your mind about any of his other work, but I do think this is him uh, operating in a different 
mode than a lot of his other work, in my opinion. And I think it is a surprisingly mature, surprisingly tender movie with a number of truly wonderful performances that we're going to, we'll talk about in more detail, but yeah, you've got, you've got Pam Greer and Robert Forrester, you've got Sam Jackson, but you've also got Robert De Niro, you've got Bridget Fonda, you've got Michael Keaton. Uh, yes. Chris Tucker shows up for a second. Yeah. It, forgot about Michael Keaton forgot earlier. About Michael Keaton with his leather jackets and his gum. Yeah. Uh, but it's, in my opinion, it's a really wonderful and surprisingly touching movie. And I think it's worth checking out. And uh, for no other reason than Pam Greer is a fucking badass. Yeah. Um, all right. So we've given you ample time. I'm, I'm even going to count you down, baby. You might be like fiddling around with stuff in your car, yo. Oh, man. Three, two, one uh all right we're we're in spoiler territory baby um you were talking about samuel L. jackson and you were also talking about robert forster and i i would say that like i would watch a whole movie of just them just like, like at sitting the bond to, office yeah, just yeah like um you know him asking questions him being robert forster asking questions and uh samuel jackson dodging them so hard with all his like fun mannerisms like i think that that uh because quentin tarantino is really known for his uh i would say chatty scenes yes uh, and where... i would i would argue he is and I, this is not an uncommon opinion he's one of the best writers of dialogue working in movies right and so, like, I think that's one of his big hallmarks is that sometimes, uh, and I think he himself, uh, when talking about this film, is like, people are going to watch it the first time for the plot, maybe. But, like, they're going to watch it the second, third, fourth time for the hangout scenes. Yes. Those, like, intimate moments where actors are just allowed to kind of just chill and really dig into the crux of what their characters are. Right. Things that have nothing to do with moving the plot forward. Stuff like in Pulp Fiction, how you spend a bunch of time with Jules and Vincent at the beginning of the movie talking about totally arbitrary shit like what they call quarter pounders in in Europe. Right. And the, the ethics of foot massages and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you get that in Reservoir Dogs as well when they're talking about when, when in the tipping scene. Yes, um, where they talk about like a virgin uh, for an extended period of time. Exactly, and so you get a lot of that in this movie. And I feel like all of the the actors, whether it be Samuel Jackson or Robert Forrester, Pam Greer, are really. I think it gives them an opportunity to, if they didn't already have any kind of like if they didn't already have uh, backstory information or like a, a real concrete perspective on their characters this really gives them a chance to kind of dive into that and and get a feel for where this character has been and where they might be going right and there is for for a number of these characters there's a good deal of source material to dig into rum punch was actually a follow-up to leonard's earlier novel the switch which yeah. features the characters of ordell and lewis played by robert de niro when they're a little bit younger that was actually uh, adapted in uh, into a movie a couple of years ago with uh most deaf and john hawks oh, as really? ordell and lewis yeah interesting but so you could go in if you wanted to, and I assume like these are very good actors, so I assume do their homework. Uh, you can go back and you can read two novels worth of material about those characters in that world, you know. So there's a lot that you can pull from to ground you in that reality. Yeah. Um, and w aside from the opening where uh, Pam Greer is kind of hanging out in the credits which, and just which doing her job. Directly pulled from The Graduate, of course. The opening of The Graduate is Dustin Hoffman on the walkway while uh, Sound of Silence plays, and the credits uh, roll the same oh. exact way. Like, that's a direct lift from The Graduate, except you slap uh, the Bobby Womack song over it and give it a sort of black exploitation title treatment. Because I think that title treatment is the same font. I believe the exact same font from Foxy Brown, yeah. which was also a Pam Greer movie. And. When Max is in the the music store, uh, the song that's playing, the rap that's playing, is by an artist named Foxy Brown. I just think mm. that's fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know Foxy Brown. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not personally. I just know of her. Yeah, she, the song, uh, what is it, Married to the Firm, that's in the movie. That's a Foxy yeah, Brown yeah, yeah. song. Uh, so, but yeah, so uh, aside from that opening scene, the Lewis and um, or or Orville. Or <laughs> Orville. <laughs> Orville. Um, uh, yeah, Lewis and Ordell are the first people that you meet and really spend time with and kind of get to know. Yeah, we see we see Jackie in the opening titles, and then we don't see her again for about like, twenty seven minutes, give right. or take. Um, because we are really getting 
to know who Ordell is between his relationship with Melanie, um, what he does with his business and like how he views guns and how like he ain't really hot shit, even though he feels like hot shit. And also like we get to know how he treats the people who work for him and how almost like ruthless and dangerous he is. Right. Uh, so he's a, he's a gun runner and he's got Jackie Brown essentially bringing money to him from Cabo in pieces, right? It's, it's a certain amount of money. She's bringing it in, in segments and his plan ultimately is to put his little nest egg together and get out of the business. But yeah, there's so much posturing and intimidation that he does. But then you've got Melanie, who's uh, Bridget Fonda, who's, you know, the blonde haired uh, beach chick, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, kind of pulling Lewis aside and being like, he's totally full of shit. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's a moron. Like most of the shit he's telling you about all the guns that he sells, it's just shit that he's heard from other people people right and lewis of course and robert de niro it's it's almost easy to forget sometimes that de niro is in the movie like he's he's playing uh what essentially amounts to like a second stringer character mm -hmm. but he plays this uh ex-con who's just gotten out of prison after what i forget i think something like seven four days yeah well got out like four days ago yeah but had was in jail for like what seven years give or take oh, yeah i think and he's he's plays he plays it so kind of bewildered and a little sleepy, you know? And like, there's a moment where they're at the bail bondsman office talking to Max and Lewis is going to go wait in the car and Ordell hands him the key fob and Lewis doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. It's like, what do I do with this? And Ordell's just like, oh, you just hit the button to unlock the car. Right. You know, there's a bunch of, he's completely now out of step with the world around him. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the, the way he plays it, just this kind of bewildered, almost lost, like, uh, what, what do I, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's, it almost, uh, because Sam Jackson is such a big character, you almost feel like he's being drug into a world that he doesn't belong in, even though he's went to jail for bank robbing, which could have also been just another thing that Ordell got him into. Right. Um, he really feels like someone who's, definitely in over his head and definitely just trying to like get get some form of foundation which he never really gets right it's uh the, that's the world he knows right the world of crime is the world that he knows and at a certain point and this is something that happens in the real world all the time it's like you're a criminal you go away and of course our our uh justice system is not really about reformation it's about throwing people in a little, little box for a while uh he comes out and what, I mean, what's he going to do? You know what I mean? Like, it's hard for an ex-con to get a legitimate job. Yeah. This is the world he knows. This is the world he understands. So at a certain point in the story, what else is he going to do except go in with Ordell on this operation to try and try and find, like you say, like try and find that, that foundation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Max Cherry, the bail bondsman played by Robert Forrester, enters the story when uh, an associate of Ordell's gets arrested for drunk driving with a firearm in the car and he has to essentially bond him out of jail. And because he knows that Beaumont played by Chris Tucker can't be trusted to keep his mouth shut while he's in prison, bonds him out sp specifically uh, to kill him. Right. Essentially puts him in the trunk of a car, says, you know, we're going to go uh, scare uh, some Koreans that I'm going to sell guns to. So like you pop out of the trunk with a shotgun, just like rack it, just to scare him. Mm hmm puts him in the trunk, just drives around the block and opens the trunk. And it's this cool, like super wide of him driving around the block. And yeah. it doesn't never cuts to the close up. You just see the muzzle flash of the gunshots. It's it's dark. It's also set to a fucking dope song called uh, Strawberry Letter 23 mm -hmm. by the Brothers Johnson. This soundtrack, like all of Tarantino soundtracks is absolutely fucking fantastic. <laughs> um, and then when Jackie is arrested by the police, uh, including uh, uh, Michael Keaton as Ray Nicolette of the ATF, who, by the way, also appears in another Elmore Leonard adaptation, Out of Sight, which uh, features just for one scene. I don't think he's credited, but he comes in as the Ray Nicolette character. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, it's all a Leonard verse. So <laughs> she is then arrested. She's taken in because they want Ordell and because uh, Ordell's contact in Cabo put some cocaine in with the money she was bringing in unbeknownst to her. So she gets uh, arrested for possession with intent to sell. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the detective played by Michael Bowen kind of rubs it in her face that she's a 44-year-old black woman. He hits that really hard. And that 
you know, she's, she's at this point in her life, she's working for the worst airline in the business. She only makes 16 grand a year plus shitty benefits. And if she goes away, like maybe she only does a year, but he's like, I, I would be asking myself, can I really afford to lose a year essentially? And so now Ordell is in a position with her, like, can I trust you not to talk? And I'm going to err on the side of, of no. So there's this, there's this fantastic scene uh, at Jackie's house when Ordell pays her a visit where he keeps lowering the light and most of the scene is played in darkness. And mm-hmm. it's genuinely, it's, it's kind of chilling. Like Sam Jackson, even when you have uh, Melanie whispering in Lewis's ear, ear that the dude is incompetent, dude's genuinely menacing. Oh yeah. And he, he's there to kill her. But then all of a sudden the tables turn in a moment where he's, he's got his hands around her throat and, and then all of a sudden he realizes she's got a gun pointed directly at his dick. Mm-hmm. And she is not, she is not, uh, she's had the upper hand this entire time. And he's completely unbeknownst to him. Right. And so their dynamic totally shifts in that moment. And it's the first of many, many moments in this movie where you realize everybody's attempting to play each other, but no one is reading the whole, like nobody's reading every hand of cards like Jackie Brown is reading exactly. every hand of cards. Yeah. I, I think that that's my favorite aspect of the because because we started with uh, Lewis and Ordell and then we had the uh, ATF people and then kind of hang hung out with uh, I guess what I'm saying uh, in consolidated form is because we spent all these scenes with the disparate other sides whether it be um, the crime people the the law enforcement or the love interest Robert Forrester Hmm. um, we get to see them as POV characters as well which means that we get as much information as they do at any given moment right Um, so I think it's really effective that we get that first 20 minutes with not Pam Greer because that means that we're allowed and and it eases us into seeing through these other people's eyes as opposed to just watching her do her thing and and essentially at that point we'd have to know what the plan is at each given moment right um whereas we're allowed to be surprised because we like for example there's that moment when she comes out of the uh this is during her big plan Mm -hmm. um and she comes out of the dressing room oh the plan by the way she sees a, a way that she can not only get herself out of hot water with the law but also maybe walk away with about half a million dollars of ordell's money exactly um but we get this really great like wonder um where she is it's so it's panic. The the camera movements are, are erratic, and they're constantly spiling around her as she's leaving the uh, the dressing room. And so, like, if she was our only POV character, we would assume that like she got taken, mm-hmm. like something's happening, something went wrong with the plan. But then we also get um, the scenes with the other POV characters, and we realize that everything that they do is all according to the the plan that she laid out. Right. Um, and I think that that was a really great way of, of shifting between the different characters that we've spent so much time getting to know. Right. She's, she's able to effectively play every character in the movie, right? Like she, she plays, uh, Ray Nicolette by essentially pretending to cooperate. She's playing Ordell by essentially pretending not to cooperate. And she's even, she's even playing Max a little bit in so far as she doesn't let him in on every part of the plan right and then of course at the same time you've got melanie trying to play lewis against ordell mm-hmm. so it's a whole no most folks in this film are not trustworthy except max who's who's a very nice man that's true um i do like that uh lewis immediately went to ordell and was like yo she, she's not trustworthy yeah and he's like i know yeah i know like but i can, I, handle, I can but, handle yeah this. right that's why i keep her around because yeah. like I know that even though I can't trust her, I know what she's going to do. Right. Um, oh, man, that, that sweet cockiness. But, like, I, it really showed how close those characters are, even though, like, I don't feel like they talk to each other a lot. Well, Lewis doesn't talk very much at all. Right. Like, I feel like a lot of the time, Ordell talks to Lewis, and Lewis nods. Mm-hmm. Um, because it seems like, you know, we don't know, like Lewis almost seems like a guy who maybe spent a bunch of time in solitary confinement because he really seems completely disconnected from other people. Right. Like it seems like 
uh, it's almost hard to conceive of him being in in gen pop in prison because at least there you're, you're going to be talking to some people mm-hmm. this dude it seems like a guy who not only is out of step with the world around him once he gets out of prison uh, after a long stint but he seems like a guy who's now genuinely out of step with communicating at all with other people right which eventually comes to head when he uh is getting antagonized by melanie yep um i i was wondering in that moment because he he shoots her Mm -hmm. and i was wondering if that was part of the plan and that like he was always supposed to shoot her but then you get uh ordell uh i guess real realizing that he actually cared about her i don't know if i would go so far as he really cared about her he cared about her so much it was like he he she was she was his main bitch i mean he literally says once he's like okay you shot her he's like uh well, now what we don't want is that bitch surviving on us and shit like that. I right. don't know if it's he genuinely cares, but no, I mean, he, I guess in his own Ordell sort of way, maybe, but I don't think it's genuine affection the way we think of genuine affection. Oh my gosh, she's like, he loves her so much. No, but what I, what hashtag I, relationship goals. But what I really love, though, about that exchange after. Lewis shoots Melanie and sidebar I really love that Lewis looks completely disheveled the entire movie but then for the job he's like slicked his hair back and stuff like that Mm -hmm. I I dig that little touch but that exchange the the thing I really love about that exchange is once he tells Ordell that he shot Melanie one of Ordell's immediate reactions is why couldn't you just have hit her in the face and Lewis takes a second and he's like well I guess I could have, but you know, in the moment, I just sort of like it just hadn't occurred to him. <laughs> he was so angry, and it just didn't occur to him to strike with a fist instead of bullets. Right. And something again, something about the way De Niro plays that. Like again, this dude is so so out of step with everything that it just genuinely did not occur to him in that moment <laughs> to do anything but shoot her. Right. Um. Which that scene also when, uh, when Ordell has to shoot has to hard quotes arbitrarily um, decides to he decides that he uh is gonna kill lewis it's a real bummer because like lewis seems super loyal yes and in that scene ordell is basically blaming him and for a second proposes that he was trying to get over on him Mm -hmm. like he's like oh yeah she conveniently gets shot and all of my money disappears what happened to it my dude and uh lewis is like how dare you you're my best friend (laughs) why would you why would you even suggest that look look at my necklace and it's like half of a best friend necklace and he's like i threw my half away and then shoots him sad um i don't I think that was the saddest death in the whole movie. <laughs> I didn't get to know Beaumont very well, so I can't no. be sad that he's dead. No. Um, except for the fact that, like, you know, it's sad when people kill off Chris Tucker. It's a bummer. How often does that happen? I think that's the only time. It happens in two out of the three Rush Hour movies. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> does he die in Fifth Element? Um, no. I don't remember. He doesn't. He survives. It's great. Um because that's my favorite Chris Tucker. A live Chris Tucker is my favorite Chris Tucker. <laughs> uh, um, all right. <laughs> I'm sure Chris Tucker appreciates that. I'm I'm glad if you're Chris Tucker if you're listening. Listen, listen. Listen. If you're listening, hey. What's up? I enjoy your career. You've done a lot of good things. You made me laugh. I think a lot of who I am humor-wise might be because I've watched your movies. Hey, you're a funny guy. I didn't realize you were such hey, a Chris Tucker hey. stan. I don't like that term. No. I do not like the term stan. I um, is that does it come from that M&M song? Yes, it does. Is that, is that where it's, that comes from? It does, and it's is terrible. That, is that why you don't like it? It is. Because that's a real upsetting story? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, guys, <laughs> this is our PSA about the term stan. If you're unfamiliar or you're old like me, uh, to stan someone is... Uh, a reference to a Eminem song in which a fan named Stan writes him letters and eventually the letters escalate to him killing his wife and unborn child. Um, and himself, I believe. Yes, and himself. Uh, it's rough and it uh, to- shows the toxic side of fandom. And so for people to uh, laud that as an aspirational thing. I feel like it has lost its connection to that, to its I, origin. Though. I, I feel like... 
Th- words have meaning. No, I, Lex I don't disagree with you, but I feel like nobody's using it with that in mind anymore. I feel well, like I feel like it's now permutated into people just use it to reference being a fan of something, being a fan of something in a way that like you'll argue for it. Essentially, is the way I see it used. It, but it means your fan. It, <laughs> You're going to kill your that, wife. And yeah, child. <laughs> to the degree that you will kill for it. All right. Well, yeah. that's you and Chris Tucker. No. <laughs> yep. I will kill for Chris Tucker. <laughs> Um, oh man, it's terrible. The world is sad. It really is. Just, <laughs> just like, the, just, well, I mean, look, the, the sadness, uh, uh, regarding the death of Lewis is undercut slightly by the fact that he did just murder Melanie for no reason whatsoever. Like I get that she's annoying, but not shoot her to death in a parking lot. Annoying. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it does put it kind of a damper on that in that no one is really, no one's really a good person in this movie. Except Max. I think Max is a good person. Is he, though? I think he is. You know, he, he did help break the law. Break, break, breaking the law. But he doesn't, but he barely takes any money for himself. Like, at the end of the movie, Jackie says, like, I would feel better if you took more of this money. And he's like, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, but, like, then he goes into the back, uh, and they, they blur it out a little bit. But he's, he starts sobbing as far as i can tell i don't know i'm not good at reading body language i don't think he's sobbing but, but I think he's, he's definitely emotionally yes. affected i don't think it's because he actually wanted more he money was like damn it i should have got taken more money i should have <laughs> retired i'm a i'm an idiot i could have i could have taken money had the girl of my dreams oh boy i could be in madrid right now do doing sex but there's that but there's that moment right like he clearly there's true genuine affection between the two of them and yeah. he could have gone with her but a i think he's too good a guy to want to have that life and i feel like look I've, i i could buy that max will find his way out of the bail bond business regard without without that money yeah um it seemed like he was thinking about doing that before he had any clue he had a shot at money like that right um but there's that there's that moment at the end of the movie where jackie looks at him and she smiles and she goes are you scared of me and he holds up his fingers and he's like a little bit yeah because he knows right like he knows how insanely capable she is and how insanely smart she is and how Mm -hmm. she really is able to play people and yeah, he he may genuinely be in love with her, but that's that's some intimidating shit. Oh yeah, because um, then at some point in the relationship, you're gonna be like, I don't know if I'm doing things because I want to or because she <laughs> wants me to. Do. Am I am I now just a robot programmed by the love of my life? <laughs> uh, so I get that. I just think that like he could have been he could have been on a beach doing the sex, and he could have, but like that's not you know that's not who he is, and I think there's something. There's something admirable about how, you know, he's got regrets, right? And he talks about how, you know, I've been doing, I've been in the bail bond business for many, many years and I'm just, I'm just tired of doing it. And he doesn't really know what he's got to look forward to. But like, there's that really nice conversation that they have earlier in the movie, Max and Jackie, about like how they feel about getting older. Yeah. And Max talks about how it's not, you know, like, well, well, Jackie talks about how it's something that that bothers her to a degree. And Max talks about how, no, it's not something I I really think about. Like, I got sensitive a few years ago when I started losing my hair and I did something about it. And it's really only at that moment that you look at his hair and it's like, oh, I guess, yeah, you do have plugs, don't you? Right. Um, But you wouldn't notice because he looks good. And he's like, I did it because I... It makes just makes me feel better about myself. And I look in the mirror and and it looks like me and stuff. Yeah. But he seems like a guy who is generally yes he has regrets there are things in his life that he's not super happy with but for the most part he's okay with who he is and he's okay with what he has even though he's not necessarily the fondest of of what he's doing anymore so i like that at the end like max max is able to remain so true to that yeah that he ultimately says i'm not i'm not gonna go on this journey mm. i think he's just, i think he's a nice man i'm sure uh, I'm, sure. I'm sure maybe maybe she'll once he retires she'll pay for him to come out to the shores of barcelona and uh they retire together maybe i mean look it's it's uh we don't know for sure that jackie's never ever going to come back you know one, now that she's out of trouble with the law now that at the end of the movie spoilers ordell is dead and so ordell's not going to be coming after her anymore 
she's got all this money. You know, there's no reason she has to stay out of L.A. So it's entirely possible she'll globe hop for a little while and then come back and they can they can work out their stuff. And I'm rooting for those kids. Yeah. All right. I take that as canon that uh, at some point, like she takes a year, finds herself um, and then she comes back and she's like, yo, I'm here to bail you out of this job. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's what I've always wanted. Is that your Robert Forrester? Yeah, it sounds just like him, doesn't it? Just like him. Hey, it's me, Robert Forrester. All right. So the other thing that I do really (laughs) appreciate about this movie is you get a genuinely tender, fairly honest uh, look at a relationship between two people that are mid-40s and older. Yeah. You know, and I feel like you don't. You don't get to see that all that often. And I think it's nice. Yeah, I I did appreciate that because as you were saying earlier, like you can explore what that means to people. Like, and, and I think that like, especially as I'm a growing person and as I get older, I start to realize that how those dynamics change and how mm-hmm. like meeting people when you're older is different and how like it used to be very easy to meet people. Uh, I was just having this conversation the other day about how you could just walk into a room and go, hey, fuck faces. Who likes insert thing? And then three people raise their hand. And I you, love insert your best, thing. Right. Yeah. They're your best friend for like the next six years. Um, but like as you get older and then, don't you know, fr- that's just friendships that like, you know, it's harder to find people you can trust and people who are on the same wavelength. And then let alone when you start dating or like really trying to get close to people and as you get older, you get more and more baggage and having to like sort through that and figure out healthy ways of having those relationships and things of that sort. Right. And realizing, I mean, so we've talked on this show a little bit, a little bit in the past and certainly off mic uh, quite a bit uh, for whatever reason, you know, I mean, look, we're, we're young guys, but obviously all of us are, are getting older and, and we're both, I think, I mean, I won't speak for you, but for me, certainly I'm at the point in my life, in my adulthood where, yeah, I, I still feel like a kid most of the time, but I'm not anymore. Right. And, and we're all we're all getting older and things keep going no matter what benchmarks you clear or not. Time is going to keep going. You are going to keep aging. And there's a lot of life, even if even if things are good. Right. For a lot of people, there's a lot of life when you get to a certain age where you realize like, it's, it's all a little disappointing maybe Mm. and maybe uh i didn't become a rock star or uh, an astronaut or or whatever the shit you know and like okay here's what i thought my life was going to be here's what my life actually is and how do i navigate that right and certainly like we're we're still young guys right but i haven't seen this movie in a few years and even now as a as a younger adult there is so much more there that I felt seriously affected by, that I could understand in a way. Now, obviously, I don't know yet what it's like to be in my mid forties or older, but even now, like I'm, I'm, I'm still under thirty. Right. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm fucking, I'm twenty nine years old. I'm about to be thirty, and even now, like right, like I feel like for a lot of for a lot of people, this is right around the time, if you're paying attention, where you start to go, oh, this shit is temporary. You know what I mean? Like I am going to age and life is finite and things move kind of quick and eventually we're all going to die. Right. Well, okay. What am I doing? What do I want my life to look like versus versus what does it look like now versus what is it likely to look like in the future? What do I hope for? What can I expect? How best to manage those expectations to to minimize the amount of regret that I'll one day maybe have to live with the amount of disappointment. So I think about all these things way more than I I have to at the age I'm at, right? Because both of us, we're still, we're still young guys, but I think about this stuff maybe more, more than is necessary. Yeah. So to see that addressed uh, and communicated, like made explicit between these two characters while they are, while they are kind of falling in love with each other in a very reserved way way right because like you say like it's very different meeting people when you're younger versus when you are middle-aged right Mm -hmm. like especially in terms of of date i mean i would assume again i've never had to date as a middle-aged person but i would assume that is very 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 different than when you're dating in in high school so seeing these two characters very gradually warm to each other meet in the middle and along the way they're having these very frank discussions about this this subject matter yeah uh 
there's something about it that is so, I mean, yes, tender and touching, but I feel like the word is a little bit beautiful because it is super fucking honest and played by these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful actors who really hadn't been on screen that way in quite some time. So, right. so for all we know, right, and I, I don't know this personally because I don't know either one of these people personally, for all we know, they were at points in their lives as actors where maybe they were feeling a little bit of that themselves, yeah. where they had these careers but they hadn't really been on most folks' radar for a long time. So even if they're working a little bit, you know, maybe there was a little bit of, well, here's what I thought my life, my career would have looked like, and here's what it looks like now, Yeah, you know? And then they get they get Jackie Brown, and you get to see them play scenes that are, are dealing explicitly with that. Now, I don't know if that was on either one of their minds, but point is this shit is what i think is insanely effective and it very much affected me and it feels so unlike anything in any other tarantino movie the closest he has come to making a movie like this since is his most recent in my opinion his most recent movie once upon a time in hollywood that is the the relationship between uh rick dalton and cliff booth the dicaprio and Pitt characters yeah is in my opinion by far the most tender relationship since Jackie Brown and Max Cherry. Um, do they also smooch at the end, those two characters? Unfortunate spoilers, they don't. Mm. But that there, there's like, there's eye smooching. I feel like there's eye smooching. That like happens. they rub their eyeballs against each other? Yeah, just like that. That's exactly yeah. what I mean. Okay. All right. I was out, then I was in. Yep. I mean, I'm, I'm in it for the eye smooching. Yeah. If two men's eyes don't touch each other intimately i'm going to be very disappointed all right well that's that's where your bar is i guess yeah it's important to have standards and you're gonna you're gonna come home and i'm gonna walk in and i'm gonna have my leather gloves on and i'm gonna be like so you uh lied to me about that movie and then i'm gonna slowly put my hands around your neck as i lower the lights throughout our conversation I, I do appreciate that I'm Jackie Brown in this scenario. Yeah. I've always, I've, I've aspired to be Pam Greer. Since I mean, I small. we all do. We all kind of aspire we, to be Pam One Greer. could be so lucky. <laughs> um, all right. Do you have any final thoughts on this before we wrap out? Uh, one, one random little piece of trivia. There's a, a scene in the movie after Jackie gets arrested where she's thrown in jail yeah. and as she's walking in uh the song that's playing long time woman is performed by pam greer and it's from uh i believe it's the big dollhouse black exploitation movie from the early 70s oh really yes yeah, so that's a fun little bit of trivia mostly i think i think my feelings overall are a little bit i mean i think i've made a lot of them clear i've been doing a lot of talking uh i love this movie i genuinely do i i completely understand why spike lee was put off by it uh i do think it's interesting i do think it's interesting uh spike lee's buddy samuel l jackson was fairly vocal at the time about defending uh the the sort of uh, authorial choices made in the movie right uh but i i love this movie i think yes uh even though it's maybe not the word i would think to use uh you could call it Tarantino's most mature work, his most grounded work, even more, I mean, more so uh, in terms of being grounded than Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I think it's a, a really lovely movie while also being a really effective kind of a, a crime caper film. Yeah. Uh, and it's not, it's very much not a black exploitation movie, but of course, all of that from the casting of Pam Greer to the soundtrack choices to the title treatment, obviously, yes, he's lifting a ton from, from that. There's also a little bit of De Palma stylistically in there and i know tarantino's a huge de palma guy mm. uh mostly i want to get your your final thoughts because i know you're not a, a tarantino person to the same extent that a lot of tarantino people are tarantino people you've never right. seen this movie i know that you were aware of the the controversy uh regarding the use of language but i didn't know how much you did or did not know about this movie going in i want to know from you uh what what were your expectations and how did it align with your expectations or uh, diverge from them? And ultimately, when you walk away from this movie, how how are you feeling about it? Yeah, I mean, I uh, don't think I really had any expectations going in in that I just knew that the movie existed. I remembered seeing like advertisements for it when I was young. 
Um, but it wasn't a movie that I was taken to, not a movie I consumed. Um, I don't think I was really like exposed to Quentin Tarantino until like I, the name until high school. Okay. Um, I feel like that's when a lot of people, uh, our generation kind of right. got to know his stuff. And then like my first Tarantino film was Kill Bill, um, I which I feel a, like is yeah. a kind of a departure from his usual style a little bit there's a i feel like there are distinct phases to tarantino's career there's the tarantino that did reservoir dogs pulp fiction jackie brown there's the tarantino who did kill bill and death proof uh which were the most explicit sort of like here's uh we're we're literally gonna rip all of this stuff from like older schlocky exploitation movies and make that um and then there's the quentin tarantino that made bastards that made Django hateful eight and once upon a time in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I feel like these are fairly distinct. I feel like you can track the distinct phases and I feel like the movies of these individual phases all feel a little bit more of a piece than they do with some of the other movies in his oeuvre. Yeah. Real quick. wanted to go back because you saw some of the marketing for Jackie Brown. I still think about this sometimes, uh, the, all of the like TV spots and trailers and stuff. And this was still in the age where like you get the, the, and it's not the trailer guy, but you know, you'd get somebody in the trailer telling you like, what do these people all have in common? They're all on the trail of whatever the fuck. So in all, all of the marketing, the they'd say, from the novel by Elmore Leonard. And I would always think to myself, but that's not helpful to anybody because there's no novel called Jackie Brown. It's from a novel by Elmore Leonard, but that book's called Rum Punch. And how's anybody going to be able to find that fucking book? Um, you know, it was, 97, it was 97. Yeah, the, everyone was on the Internet. Uh, you People know, we're just getting computers, like personal <laughs> computers in their fucking homes and shit for the most part. Right, you know, so uh, that's it, you know, or town crier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you they, have an you have an usher in every theater that's like this is based on a, a novel with a different title. Right, we're sorry course. we misled you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that like the main the main draw uh, back then, I imagine, was specifically Pam Greer. Um, I think also it was something that was at the time probably felt new or or it felt like hey quentin tarantino's doing a black movie what well, um, it's also it's also uh tough to and i only really know this because when pulp fiction came out i was very young i was too young to see it when it came out right but i've heard from people who are old enough to remember pulp fiction was absolutely everywhere i mean it wasn't just a successful movie it was a full-blown phenomenon right and so tarantino was in a position where for all intents and purposes he could do essentially whatever he wanted yeah and yeah i mean already like after a second movie second movie wins the palm door and suddenly like you said much earlier in this conversation his name alone can sell the movie and i feel like that's how you get the wiggle room to get a, a studio financed movie and not cast whoever the studio wants you to cast instead say, no, no, Pam Greer and Robert Forrester are absolutely the right choices for these parts. I'm right. putting them in this movie. Yeah. Um, so I guess final thoughts basically being that like, I, I found it to be a really interesting story. I love Pam Greer. Um, and I think she did great. I think all the actors blew this thing out of the water. Mm-hmm. Um, you could just watch them doing whatever for however long. Um, and they're just like living in that space, which I really liked. Um, I don't know if, I don't know if it's a movie I would revisit. Um, in that, like, I don't know if it had enough personally to kind of like, and I guess also I'm, I'm being exposed to it much later in its existence right. and much later in, in my existence to where it's not one of those things where I'm like, Oh boy. I gotta, I gotta get that Jackie Brown in my veins. It's like, cool. I'm glad I experienced it. Um, I really liked what happened in it. Um, but I think that's my, just, that's where it ends, you know? Okay. See, for me, obviously I've been, I've been a fan for many years. This time watching it, I think was my favorite time watching it. Yeah. And I only watched it two days ago as of when we're recording this and I already feel like I'm ready to throw it on again. Interesting. Uh, I had a very new... It was a movie I always liked a good deal, but I had a very new experience with it this time. Well, because everyone in the movie, with the exception of uh, Melanie, I think is is in their probably 40s 
or older. Mm -hmm. Um, So I feel like this is definitely a movie where the older you are, the more you understand the like nuances of it. And, and the, the real, like, you also understand the stakes a little bit more yes. in that it's not a world ending thing, but it's literally the, the lo- the livelihood or longevity of Pam Greer's character. And she's in a position where either she's, she was damned if she did damned, if she didn't, if she said something, then she might've been murdered. If she didn't, uh, she might then she might've go to, going to prison. So you, you get to watch her, this character who is supposed to be past her prime, finding a way to, essentially um, get the best of both worlds and you see her prosper in, in a situation where all uh, all the pieces are against her. Yeah. Um, and that's an, that's an aspect that everyone can relate to. But I think that like when you really appreciate story, I think that's something that uh, you can kind of glean from it. It's not just like a, a, a crime thriller. It's something that like really has personal, stakes to it yes and that's exactly how i would i would choose to put it too there are obviously the stakes are very high in all of tarantino's movies but the stakes are usually very literally life and death right whereas yes few characters meet their ends in this story but i feel like and and again like once upon a time in hollywood i think is the closest he's come since to playing in territory like this but the personal stakes for these characters the non-literal life or death stakes are higher in jackie brown than i think almost anything else he's done and uh, I will say, it seems like you did like it. Uh, I'm a big fan of this movie. Somebody else who liked the movie a lot was uh, Elmore Leonard, who wrote Rum Punch. Now, worth mm-hmm. noting, of course, Tarantino wrote the screenplay himself, but L- Leonard was also a tremendous writer of dialogue as well. So there's a lot of dialogue in the movie that is pulled directly from the book. But of course, Tarantino did make a couple of big changes to the source material, and so apparently he was afraid to call Elmore Leonard uh, and let him know about any of it yeah. until like right before they started shooting. Right. And uh, the way the story goes is essentially he he calls up Elmore Leonard and he says, so, hey, uh, I've sort of been putting off talking to you because I was worried about, you know, some of the changes I made to your source material. And Elmore Leonard was essentially like, why? Because you changed the title and made her black? That's fine. Pam Greer is an awesome choice. I'm totally on board with this. <laughs> and then he read the screenplay and he said, uh, not only is it my favorite adaptation of my work that I've ever read, it's the best screenplay I've ever read. Aww. So he was, it's, he was a big fan. And, and to me, I think that praise is, is earned. I think it is certainly, I, I think, you know, what is Quentin Tarantino's quote unquote best film? I think that's a... a totally subjective question right i do think this is inarguably his most underappreciated and most overlooked movie and i think it's the one where if you're very much not a tarantino person i feel like this is the one most likely to appeal to to somebody who doesn't fall within that category you know yeah um i think this is a lovely movie yeah i dig it a lot yeah i totally get why people enjoy it i liked it um but what did you guys think? Did you have a chance to check out Jackie Brown? Uh, did you like Pam Greer's performance? The answer is yes. The answer's yes. Uh, you know, did you like the story? Um, are you a bigger fan of the book? Are you a fucking hipster who loved the book and hates black people? Um, what? A, whoa. What? Whoa. <laughs> that's, that's a hell of a Twitter bio. <laughs> Loves books, hates black people. <laughs> Uh, and it's like, I picked up a copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X and didn't know what to do. <laughs> it's like, I love this and I hate it. Um, fuck. Uh, <laughs> no, like, give us, uh, let us know what your thoughts were. Um, you can do so on Twitter at Missing Outcast, M-I-S-S-I-N-G, O-U-T-C-A-S-T. Um, you can also hit us up on our Instagram, which is the same thing, um, for intermittent pictures sometimes. Um, yes, intermittent pictures. That's that's uh, that's our new. That's that's the Twitter bio right there. Uh huh. It's missing out podcast. Intermittent pictures sometimes. <laughs> um, I do though. I'm I'm now itching to go back and read uh, read the novel again. You should. I'm really interested to read the screenplay. Is what I'm really interested. in. I'm sure you could find it online. Somewhere. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but I I regretted that I didn't have time to read it before the show because i really wanted to dive into it yeah um but i'm a busy man i do shit yo i I fuck (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, uh, but yeah, anyway, yeah, but you can't you can't uh, multitask. You can't read while <laughs> doing doing the. F- <laughs> I, I don't even want. <laughs> Oh man, Lex, where can people find you? Oh god, uh, I am on Twitter and Instagram at the Lex Michael, and you can find me at Tari J T E R I J A Y. Um, again, you can find us at Missing Outcast, M S S I N G O U T C A S T, and all the major plat- podcast platforms. So tell your friends if you enjoy the show. Um, then make sure to leave us a review or a rating and we will read it here on the show. Um, so yeah. And don't forget to let us know what you thought about Jackie Brown. Uh, until we hear from you again, this has been the retrospective that's introspective. And now you have a new perspective.